Hi everyone, you are now tuning in to Conversations with Filmmakers podcast. Our very first guest is Dave Bosser. He was the former visual effects supervisor over at Disney. And this will be part one of our discussion. Hi, everyone. I'm really excited for you guys to join us today for Conversations with Filmmakers. It's a podcast that is just trying to be more for educational purposes for those aspiring filmmakers. I am super excited to introduce the guest of the day, the millennium, the decade, who is so cool, um, Dave. Bossert. Bossert because he had to let me know, but he called me Vante, so it's okay. We're just, you know, doing our thing and everything. He had spent, he had spent 32 years at Disney as their um, VF, VFX guru, pro, supervisor, whatever you might want to say, and now he is a nonfiction writer. Dave, I am super excited to have you here. How are well, you doing today? I, uh, Vanti, I am so happy to be here and talking with you. Um, uh, you know, we I think we hit it off when when we caught up on a phone call the other day. Yes, absolutely. I felt like we could talk for hours, and that was hilarious to me because I love when people are able to open up, and you are yeah. such an open person. And with a great personality as well. So these yeah, people don't even know. I, I, I'm a total open book, so you can ask me anything you want. I love that. And I am going to be asking you a lot of questions. No, not too many, but enough to like really get to know you and everything, which I think is so important for the viewers to, um, you know, get a, have a part of that, you know? Mm -hmm. So this industry is very wide and everything, and we have a lot of you know, the millennials and all these different groups that want to get into this industry. And that is what I'm looking forward to is just getting you to, to speak more to that. So let's get started with the interview. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. So I wanted everybody to know as well, you've worked on a slew of projects for Disney, like the original Beauty and the Beast, The Little Mermaid, Aladdin, The Nightmare Before Christmas, and the list goes on and on. But Tell us, what was the project you had the most fun on? Well, I, you know, I always I, I always tell people that, I, you know, every single project I worked on, uh, mm -hmm. there, there are very fond memories. There's things I learned. Mm -hmm. um, I can't really put my finger on any one project to say it mm -hmm. was better than another project because it's almost like trying to determine who's your favorite child. And you can't really do that. <laughs> can't really do that right exactly. you know and, and not so out one, loud right and, and so one thing i would i would say when you introduced me saying i was a vfx guru at disney no i wasn't i was a visual effects animator and i became a visual effects supervisor mm -hmm. and then a creative director director producer you know i headed up a special projects unit but i was a part of an incredibly talented group of artists and craftspeople and technicians, um, you know, software engineers. And, and that's the thing I would say right off the bat is mm -hmm. that making any kind of a film or television production, whether it's live action or animated, doesn't matter. The fact is, is that you are a cog in a machine. You mm -hmm. are you are one member of a big team of people. Mm -hmm. And in, in in terms of working on a feature animated film, you know, there's five or six hundred uh, people on the, yeah. you know, the, the, the mostly artists and, and mostly uh, technicians and uh, uh, specialists and, you know, uh, production management people, but it is one big team. And that's what people really have to understand is mm -hmm. that it's not all about one person. You yeah. know, I mean, yes, it's about a director's vision or the directors. If there's multiple directors, it's about their vision and getting their vision up on the screen. But it is about a group working together to create that vision for people to enjoy when it goes to the theaters. Um, 
I so, can definitely agree with that. That is a really yeah. excellent breakdown. And would you elaborate for us then, like, what would your average day look like if you were going into, say, one of these productions and you were about to start on a project? You mentioned, like, all of those people. A lot of times, the audience that's listening may not know what that looks like. So I would love if you could break down, like, what your average day could possibly look like. Well, you know, when you're doing a feature animated film, it, mm -hmm. it, it generally uh, takes place over two to three years. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a small group of people, the director and some story artists that start on the film initially, mm -hmm. you know, and then they start to layer in more people as the production moves along. Mm -hmm. And so I, I will just tell you, when I started out at Disney, uh, my my first week at the company, I was low man on the totem pole. I was well, <laughs> yeah. I, I I had a position called an in betweener, so I oh. created drawings in between another artist's two drawings. Oh wow! To, to smooth out the action, and oh. and so when I started out as an in betweener, my day was I came in, uh, and I went into my office and I sat at a desk, and I drew, for eight yeah. hours. You know, and I had wow. a lunch break and I had a morning break for 15 minutes and an afternoon break for 15 minutes. But for the most part, I just sat at a desk and I did drawings wow. for eight hours. Now, from there, you move up the ladder and, mm -hmm. you know, I became an animator, a special effects animator. And so then it was about meeting with the uh, head of the effects department and sometimes the director and going over a series of scenes or shots as they they call them now, mm -hmm. but it's individual scenes, individual shots in a movie and, um, uh, and discussing what the director's vision is and what he wants to see in the special wow. effects that have to go into that. And then you're back at your office and you're creating, but, Sometimes, you know, when I had a scene issued to me, I would go back to my office and I had this really nice vintage leather chair. It was like a yeah. leather recliner, but not what like color? A what color? It, it, was, it, it was tan. It was oh. it was like it was like a tan naga hide. OK, it was like <laughs> it was like automotive upholstery. And, uh, <laughs> and, and 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 I'll tell you that I oftentimes I would go back to my office and I would sit in that recliner. Mm -hmm. And I'd, I'd stare out the window or I'd stare at the ceiling or I'd, I'd sit there with my eyes closed. And, and that's part of the process. Mm -hmm. it, for me, it was visualizing what the director wanted to see in the scene. And before I could start drawing, I really needed to see it, mm -hmm. you know, in my mind's eye. In, in yeah. my mind, I had to see that, um, you know, that image of what it is I was going to create. Uh, and and sometimes there were production management people that just thought you were goofing off, mm -hmm. you know, that because you were just you know sitting in a recliner with your eyes closed or staring off in the space, and uh, and actually it was an important part of the process. Yeah, absolutely. I know, you know I had a producer tell me recently because you know I told you yesterday I'm a screenwriter and everything, and I do the same thing. I feel like us as story creators or writers we're like the original virtual reality. Like we literally walk in the room and we can see it in our mind's eye in order to bring it to life. And that's what he said. He said, I'm so happy you didn't rush because you're busy, right? And yeah. you're so busy, don't rush into it. Take that time until it's right there, right? So that's really amazing. Yeah, and, and you know, uh, that that was the process. And, and look, as, as I moved along in my career and, and and took on greater responsibilities, you know, when when I became a visual effects supervisor and uh, I was in charge of a, an effects department on, uh, a, you know, a film, mm -hmm. um, you know, I had, a, I had a group of people, you know, 18, 20 people or so, uh, you know, working in the department with me. Mm -hmm. And, and so then you start to, 
have, you know, management responsibilities and you have, you know, people you have to answer to and you have to turn out a certain amount of work each week in order to meet the schedule of the project. And mm -hmm. there's, you know, it's very fluid. There's, there's all kinds of hiccups. Scenes take longer. Other scenes, you know, don't take as long as you thought they would. Uh, there's uh, changes being made in the production as it's in production. So something that you may have done might get thrown out and you have to redo it or do something new uh, because mm -hmm. they made changes. So um, uh, it, there was a lot more going on. It was a more dynamic day. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and then, you know, as the as the division became much more successful in this sort of renaissance of Disney animation with Beauty and the Beast and Aladdin and Lion King and Pocahontas and those films in the mm -hmm. 1990s, you know, there there were more more production people being added on uh, the the division started growing. They were doing uh, leapfrog production. So there was two productions going on at once so that they could put a movie out, an animated film out every year. Um, you know, there was wow. more meet. There was more meetings. There was more logistics really to juggle. Yeah. Um, you know, so you just as you move up the ladder, you do get busier, you have more variety in your day um, and more responsibilities. You are tuned in the Conversations with Filmmakers podcast. Now a word from our sponsors. We are proud to present Who Nation TV Plus, a worldwide urban TV, movies, culture and entertainment platform available on the Roku and Fire TV networks. Download the Who Network app on the Google Play Store and join the Who Nation social community for true freedom of speech and expression with friends and family today. Or visit whonetwork.com. That's who, H-O-O -O Network. Thanks everyone and we are so happy to be sponsored by them. Hi there and welcome back to Conversations with Filmmakers podcast. And how did you know you were ready to manage teams? So you were saying that you were you know, at the low totem pole, the in-between helping out, and then yeah. you were slowly moving up, you were, you then started managing these teams and the logistics. When yeah. did you feel like you were really ready for that? Well, I, you know, I think that as you go along, like I, I, I went, I became an animator and then I became a supervising animator. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and then I became a visual effects supervisor. And, and and it was funny during the 1990s, I actually started going to the Anderson School of Management at UCLA at night. And I oh, was well. taking management classes and accounting classes and, you know, things that, you know, one of the things w with uh, artists that they don't necessarily get when they go to school is mm -hmm. business classes. You know, and uh, and it's so important if you're going to be an artist that you have, a, a, a you know, knowledge of business. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I know so many, so many artists that really have never been able to sort of advance their artistic careers mm -hmm. because they're not good at business. Mm -hmm. You know, so, some of them. They, all they want to do is just sit and paint or draw and and, and that's all they want to do and that's yeah. fine you know but but there there's others that i think would like to move up the ladder but they don't really they, they really can't they've hit a wall mm -hmm. because they don't really have the knowledge or the wherewithal to be able to manage people yes you know and and yeah, and and managing creative people is is very different than managing you know uh, a group of workers at a supermarket that are stocking shelves. You Absolutely. know, uh, when you, when you're managing creative people, you you have to be aware of you know the quirks and the the uh, you know the the various personalities, uh, and, and you can't you can't manage all in one uh way yes you, you almost have to manage people individually and as a group you know Absolutely. And, 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 and so for me you know i had artists who you know they they work best into the evenings and they like to come in at 10 or 10 30 in the morning mm -hmm. and i had other people who like to come in at seven in the morning 
and I was more of a morning person. But for me, I always accommodated whatever the work schedule was, as long as the person gave us an honest day, you know, and, and if they, that. you know, if they, if they wanted to work until eight or nine o'clock at night, that, that was up to them. You know, if that, if that was the way it worked for them to get the best out of them, that more power to them. And I, I was fine with it. That is a true New Yorker right there, just like myself. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, and, and by the, I, I was just going to add to it. And by the way, you know, uh, I was never worried about somebody, you know, uh, uh, cheating us or not doing yeah. their job because they had work that they had to produce. And if they weren't producing it, then they weren't working. Absolutely. So it was more like measuring those metrics by producing the content and you're saying like you were doing a flexible work schedule before it was even the norm to do like a lot of you know a lot of companies are doing that now but back then it wasn't it was something unheard of they wanted you to be on that nine to five grind so Uh, absolutely i'm sure you had people vying to try and get on your team because you know life happens right you know we're just coming out of a pandemic where we had to work remote and that created such flexibility for a lot of people so yeah and no and i agree with that and, and but my philosophy had always been that you know yes life happens there are things people have to do during the day but also i i trusted the people i had on my team mm-hmm. so there's a certain level of trust and, and by the way there were people over the years that violated that trust you know and you you sit and talk to them and you tell them what the score is. And I was always very blunt about that. Mm -hmm. Uh, And you give them another chance. And, and if, and if they don't course correct, then they're, they're gone. And and I made, I made that very clear right up front. When the first time I had to talk with somebody um, uh, about, you know, their, you know, behavior, uh, their their work behavior, the work ethic, Mm-hmm. Um, I told him right up front, look, I, you know, I'm, I'm happy to accommodate you if, if you can't, you know, if you don't want to come in early, if you don't want to come in, you know, you want to come in midday and work in later, I'm totally fine with it. But, you know, if you're, if you're going to skate here and, and, and cheat me out of, uh, an honest day's work, uh, if you keep it up, you're gone. And I was mm-hmm. that blunt about it, you know, and, you know, and there was one person, one or two people over the years that I had to cut loose, but most people, you know, I respected them. I trusted them mm-hmm. and they got the work done. And that's all that matters. And, in and, 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 you know, something 10 years from now, 10 years after the movie was released, nobody's going to be sitting in the theater go, Oh, you know, that scene well, that, that took three days longer than it should have. You know, yeah. no, 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 nobody, nobody's going to say that, you know, no. the people are just going to sit there and enjoy the film for what it is. Yes. Absolutely. You know, so now a message from our sponsors. We are excited to bring you this world exclusive teaser from Bad Rabbit Pictures and Movie Pods. They are presented Age of Prophecy, a sci-fi fantasy podcast done in the style of the radio dramas of yesteryear. Coming soon to all streaming platforms. Visit www.moviepods.com or www.thenukechronicle.com for all the release dates. You won't want to miss this one. Your myths were born from our history. Let's check it out. Life. A vile, messy sequence of events before we die. All designed for something beyond us. It has to be. Or else, what's the point? You don't know me, but I know you. I am responsible for your triumphs and miseries. I am Zira and Lil Zor. And to truly understand your own story, you must know mine. Your myths were born from my history. Hi there, and welcome back to Conversations with Filmmakers podcast. And to go back to what you had mentioned about business as well, um, can you speak more on, you were saying like to get trained up. So I know a lot of times, you know, 
like uh, for instance right now right we have the instagrams and the tiktoks and all of that and a lot of young kids are trying to get the revenue from that but they really sometimes don't understand business right um you're working in education now correct we have well i i mean i i'm i'm writing uh you know i go out and lecture occasionally at schools yeah you know and that kind of a thing but i i wouldn't say i'm working in education you know, I've done educational films. I, and, and like I said, I speak at, at various schools periodically. Uh, but but the, the, the important thing that people have to realize is that, you know, because you ask, how, how, do, how do people get these skills? A lot of it is on the job training. It's having Absolutely. good bosses and learning from those bosses on how to manage you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and it's really, that's what it boils down to. I think, you know, when I, when I first got out of uh, school, I went to Cal arts and, and I was in the character animation program at Cal arts. And mm -hmm. when I left there and eventually got hired at Disney, I learned more in the first six months I was at Disney about animation production than I did the three years I was at Cal Arts. And I think that's mm -hmm. a natural with any profession and anybody who's coming out of college. Whatever the job is you're going to get, you're going to learn more in that first six months or that first year than, than anything you learned in, in, in the college program you were in. Mm -hmm. um uh but it it i i really would stress that it's important to have some good mentors and some uh you know hopefully good managers that you can look up to and get guidance from and advice from because mm -hmm. that's what you're going to learn you're going to learn on the job you know i mean as an artist i went i took the time to go and take business classes at night you know, mm -hmm. because I wanted Absolutely. to have that exposure uh, to shore up, you know, that part of my thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, other people chose not to do that, you know, but, I, you know, for me, uh, it, I was able to do it. Uh, you know, sometimes it was tough, you know, doing a full day and then go and do a three hour class at night and driving home late and all of that. But uh, I look back on it and it was so worth it. And, and also just education when you get out into the work world, just keeping up on new technology, learning new programs, new software, you know, just the, the newest things that are coming along in whatever industry you're in. If Absolutely. you're in the entertainment industry, it's really about keeping on top of the trades and reading reading the articles and and you know reading interviews with filmmakers and and all of those things mm -hmm. uh, to to keep abreast of what's going on in your industry absolutely and going back to the mentoring process did you have a mentor yourself you know i had i had several mentors uh That's throughout great. my my career uh people that i looked up to people that i wanted to emulate uh people mm -hmm. that i asked advice of um and uh and i also had some crappy bosses you know <laughs> oh, yeah. that, that that were you know opaque in their communication and mm -hmm. um uh you know mercurial in their behavior and you know never really getting any kind of guidance from them you know, and that's, it's kind of a shame. And, and that wears you down a bit too, Absolutely. you know, because, because it's frustrating. It's, it's sort of an energy suck. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, you know, uh, you gotta, you gotta roll with some of this uh, when you get into the industry, but it's so important to get your foot in the door in an entry level position mm -hmm. and then set your sights on what it is you want to do and, and become friends with some of those people that are doing those things mm -hmm. and ask them questions and ask them for their advice and see if you can, you know, apprentice with them or, you know, do something on your own time to show them that you're serious about, you know, going into this field. Hi everyone, and thanks again for joining us. Just so you know, Dave Bussert is actually going to be releasing a visual companion book for The Nightmare Before Christmas. That will be dropping on September 26th. Please check out his website at www.davebussert.com to learn more. 
Hi there, and welcome back to Conversations with Filmmakers podcast. And I would also say to the audience, um, thinking outside of the box on trying to find those opportunities. You know, um, Dave, when I first started over at Sony Pictures, I was able to get in there because they had a staffing agency on site. And a lot of people didn't realize that, like a lot of the major studios have, you know, vendors that they work with that right. you can go and apply for um, through them. It takes a little bit of research and everything, but it is definitely out there. So it's not always just, oh, let me look on the company's website, think outside of the box and definitely networking. And I'm sure that's something that you are excellent at doing, Dave is um the networking process you know you know i i kind of think of myself as as not a great ne uh networker but i I, I know a, but but i know a lot of people you know what i mean so <laughs> i don't know you know uh, like, I, I i i guess you know if if you want to say i guess i'm a soft networker you know what i mean <laughs> it's like I, i'm not out going to the parties and all that kind of stuff yeah. all the time and you know glad handing people but you know i know a lot of people in the industry and uh and i i have the pleasure of working with some of those people or you know reaching out to them if i need help with something you know mm -hmm. and it's been a big help actually with uh with the books i've been writing you know Absolutely. to to be able to you know i there there's a a wonderful art director and and uh background artist who i've worked with for decades and mm -hmm. Um, you know, she, she helps me all the time with, uh, you know, digital restorations and, you know, other, uh, you know, recreating, uh, pieces of art and things like that. Uh, she, she, you know, I, I could pick up the phone or send her an email and, uh, and we, we just work. And so, you know, it is important to network because you know you build up a, a what i used to call a rolodex you know we don't have rolodexes uh, 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 anymore i'm it's dating digital myself rolodex now yeah. <laughs> but, you know you you build up all these contacts and you keep in touch with people and you know and, and i have people calling me and asking for favors if i know somebody or if i know then i connect people and mm -hmm. you know let them go off and do their thing uh, you know, that, that's, was, that's really just what friends do, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I'm happy to do it, but, uh, but if you're just starting out, it's important to, you get your foot in the door and I always stress entry level position, just take yeah. whatever, take whatever it is. I know a number of artists, uh, that be had very successful careers who started out in the mailroom at Disney. Mm hmm and they wanted to go into the animation department but there was no openings but the but the hiring person said well we do have a a position in traffic which was their mail department mm -hmm. and uh and they would ride their bikes around the studio lot and go to the different buildings and deliver mail to people's offices and uh and so i know a number of people who said well i'll, I'll take that job and they Absolutely. they took they took the job in the mail room and then they were delivering mail to people in the animation department and, and they introduced themselves and they got to know people. And then on their lunch break, they were doing tests and getting training from these, you know, incredible uh, Disney artists. Wow. And, and then eventually when a, when a, a, a position opened in animation, they got hired into it from the mail room. So, mm -hmm. you know, and that, and, and, and we always hear countless stories of people at television networks and even though networks are kind of you know going by the wayside i guess with streaming <laughs> but yeah. you know uh you 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 know talent agencies you always hear about people starting in the mailroom and then they become mm -hmm. you know an assistant or an assistant agent or and, an know, agent, and, and, yeah. and then they eventually become an agent themselves you know and uh and so i think uh you know it's important for people not to get ahead of themselves. I've seen a lot of people come out of school and they do, I want to be a director right now, you know? And it's and, like, you don't even know all the positions on. Yeah, you know, so, you know, and, and obviously, look, every once in a blue moon, there's some genius, you know, who, mm -hmm. who can, you know, really direct a movie. I mean, you know, a Steven Spielberg or somebody who, you know, right out of, you know, college or whatever, you know, 
gets that break and and makes a great movie right yeah. so i i just feel as though most people most of us but you know most yeah. of us a a average uh joes here and janes uh <laughs> you know we we just have to we, we just have to um try and get our foot in the door mm -hmm. and, and the thing i would say is that you're gonna have a lot of doors slammed in your face you're not gonna get those opportunities yeah. Uh, but but you have to keep plugging at it. You really have to keep plugging at it. And uh, we had discussed that yesterday as well, yeah. or the other day when we spoke about um, a yes, a no can turn into a yes in a corporate environment really quickly. You know, um, Ab absolutely. Could, yeah. So I, that was something that was um, really important to touch on as well, like you mentioned. Yeah, and, and also you know, first impressions count. You know, oh, yeah. and, and and I I really believe this. I I think there's this sense today that people can you know just show up uh, in in ripped jeans and you know a t-shirt uh, for a job interview, and uh, I I think that speaks volumes. I, I and I'll tell you a funny story. I was looking at portfolios, uh, and it was one of these like sort of portfolio day kind of things at a college. Mm -hmm. you know where where people had their portfolios laid out and and uh and somebody walked in and they had all of their artwork folded up under their arm <laughs> right and and so the thing i looked at that and i thought to myself well he has no respect for his own artwork why would he have any respect for the artwork we're creating for a movie absolutely that that, that was that was my impression of the person you know, <laughs> and, you know, whereas other people had, you know, taken the time to mat artwork or put it into a, uh, you know, a, a, a clear sleeve of a portfolio case, you know, and I'm talking, you know, that that's 20, 25 years ago. No, you know, but it's nowadays, right. nowadays, people have their portfolios on a on a really nice website, you know, uh, but there's times and, where even if I go on a job interview, I still print out my resume. Even sure. if they have a copy, you know, I bring copies with me and yep. they're like, oh, we already have it, but thank you for bringing it. Yeah. Right? So, and, it's, yeah. You know, and, and it's just, it, it's dressing, you know, respect, respectfully, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, even if it's casual environment, you know, go in with a shirt and tie on if you're, if you're a guy, you know, put on a sports jacket, look clean and neat you know, yes. and, and, you know, same for women, clean and neat, uh, yes. is, is what you should be doing. You shouldn't, it, it, you shouldn't look like you just rolled out of bed and you're going to the beach. Exactly. You know, if, if you're going on a job interview. <laughs> yeah. Just imagine if you, you know, your audience, you might do so excellent. And then they say, Hey, we're going to let you see the CEO next. And that CEO is suited and booted and you're there with some sneakers and jeans on. Yeah. It know? just doesn't always be prepared for all scenarios. Right. Yeah. I, I, I just think it's, it, it's good to make a great first impression, you know, mm -hmm. and even if you don't think you're going to get the job right. I, I always advise write a handwritten thank you note and mail it to the person you met with. Mm -hmm. You know why? Because 99% of the people that they meet with aren't going to do that. And they're going to remember you because you sent it, you know, and, and who knows, maybe that's the, just the little bit that nudges you over the finish line. You've just tuned into an episode of Conversations with Filmmakers podcast. We'd like to thank our guests for joining us and sharing their knowledge. This has been a production of Vonti Pictures, hosted by me, Vonti McRae, a screenwriter and producer. We'd also like to thank Bad Rabbit Pictures for the animated content and for their upcoming creation of podcast, Age of Prophecy, along with our sponsor, Who Nation TV, with all episodes being edited by Mr. Jacob Daly, a director and producer and a man of many talents. Come back next week as this saga continues.